meeting of the committee will come back to order. Uh, Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, while I was gone, I know the chairman asked some questions about uh, an affidavit from uh, or an interview with Lily Strain. Uh, this has to do with a very critical issue uh, that the two of you um, have um, don't seem to agree on, and that is a party at Jose Canseco's house. Um, we have an affidavit from Mr. Conseco and his wife saying they remember you not being there and being hurt that you weren't there. We have uh, contemporaneous sportscaster reports noting that you were not there. We have your golf uh, uh, ticket that you've given us that is shows you probably couldn't have been there, although maybe it's, it's possible. Um, we have um, a, a number of other people who were interviewed say they don't remember you there. So when they talk to your nanny, um, they uh, were, uh, uh, understandably, were trying to find out what she knew about it. This committee had no way to reach her except through you. Is that Mr. Clemens, right, Mr. Clemens? That's correct. We could never have interviewed her had you not intervened for us and found her. Is that correct? That's correct. And for her, her English, as I understand it, is not that good. Is that correct? It's not that good. And Adequate. she's probably never testified before a congressional committee or in congressional investigators before either. Never. So um, understandably would be reluctant to do that. Uh, can you just give us the circumstances of your, uh, obviously if you hadn't contacted her, we probably never would have been able to find her and, and been able to interrogate her. Can you just give us from your perspective how you contacted her, what meetings, and uh, what, what was said at that point so we can put this into an appropriate perspective? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Um, uh, I was told on Friday that uh, our, our nanny or sitter at the time, uh, back at that time period, was wanting to, uh, that they wanted to talk to her. And um, I reached out to her and, and uh, made the phone call, and uh, that was it. I haven't talked to her in, I, I don't know uh, how many years it's been, but we hadn't talked to her since. And uh, I know when she came to the house, uh, it was great to see her. We ain't seen her in a long time, and that's basically the conversation. I said that um, uh, we're all trying to remember some kind of uh, uh, party at uh, Canseco's house. Mm -hmm. I know that I golfed at that house, and um, I golfed, and then we uh, uh, had a golf game, and I'm, 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 I'm not uh, totally positive that I wouldn't have taken back my wife and dropped her off at the house. Uh, I, I believe that the nanny uh, was uh, there with my kids. They sure could have been. Uh, they could have gone over there in the afternoon after the party. But, but I was I was focused on what I was asked, Congressman, was ab about attending a party. A barbecue. I, so, uh, a barbecue in particular, right? A bar yeah, a barbecue or a luncheon or something of that nature. So uh, 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 could I have gone by the house uh, later that afternoon and dropped uh, my wife or her brother-in-law, the people that golfed with me? Sure, I could have, but uh, at the time of the day that I would uh, uh, express it to be, um, I was on my way to the ballpark. I would have gotten to the ballpark extremely early. This was I, like I, know, I know one thing. I wasn't there having huddled up with somebody trying to uh, do a drug deal. Right. I know that for sure. And this was, what, eight years ago, nine years ago? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McMee, let me ask you, did you ever use Roger Clemens' likeness without his permission? No. Have you ever obtained a doctorate uh, degree from a college or university? Yes. Can you explain it to us, how you obtained it? I obtained it when I was in Toronto in, uh, at the end of 98. And it was a situation where the, uh, at the time I was living in Toronto, so I was looking for something I can do correspondence wise. And I applied to several different colleges at the time and I got accepted to Columbus University in Maryland, Louisiana, and started to get take courses in accordance to nutritional counseling um, to achieve a PhD in nutritional counseling. How and many courses did you take? It was 11 courses, uh, and upon completion, a dissertation. And I took uh, every course, and what it was is they would mail you the coursework, I would take it, write a thesis paper at the end of the, the, the uh, at the end of when I finished it on my time, when I did it, as fast as I could do it, and submit it and get graded uh, in, in moving forward to the dissertation work at the end of the coursework. And did you finish? Yes, I did. And did you write a dissertation? 
Yes, I did. And what was the subject of the dissertation? The subject was uh, weight training, supplementation, and improving miles per hour on a fastball with um, pitchers. I like those. It'll be an interesting one to read. Have you ever told law enforcement investigators that you held a doctorate in behavioral sciences? Yes. It, that's not what your doctorate was in, was it? No, it's behavioral sciences with the, with the concentration in nutritional counseling. Okay. So did you, you held yourself out as a doctor then to, to athletes? PhD. PhD. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the university? Does it have a campus? Um, as I found out later, no, it doesn't. Is this one of what you call a diploma mill to some extent? As I had found out later on, yes, it is. Okay. Um, on the checks you wrote, uh, Kirk Radomsky, and printed in the appendix of the Mitchell Report at page D11, you list yourself as Dr. Brian McNamee. Uh, at that point, uh, you, you still feel you could put, hold yourself out in good faith as a doctor? I'm not, I'm not sure if I follow. Um, on the checks you wrote, uh, Kirk Radomsky, you printed in the appendix there in the Mitchell Report, you list yourself on the checks as Dr. Brian McNamee. This was in good faith. Doctor, you, I mean, you still hold yourself out as a doctor, right? I'm sure that if that was under my business account, then uh, I probably did. It was a business check. Okay. Um, I, I might see my time is up. But let me just ask, did you ask Roger Clemens and Andy, Andy uh, Pettit's permission uh, to use uh, pictures um, in one of your advertisements which promotes McNamee is Dr. Brian McNamee, who is widely recognized for his work with Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, Mike Stanton, and many other star athletes. No, I, I never asked that permission. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis on our side. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clemens, it was a pleasure to meet with you last week. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your question, you asked whether it was appropriate for Mr. Clemens to meet with his nanny, a fact witness on Sunday before the committee spoke with her. You did not ask the one lawyer on the panel his view. So I'd like to ask Mr. Sheila, a former federal prosecutor, is it usual for a client to meet with a fact witness as Mr. Clemens did? Uh, no, that is not usual. Um, I don't know any of the facts and circumstances about uh, these meetings other than what I've heard today. But what I will tell you from my experience is in the course of investigation, what is typical if there is a witness who has potentially relevant information, you have an attorney reach out to that witness or you have an attorney's investigator. What is unusual is to have the direct witness or principal to the controversy reach out to that because that could create the impression that the witnesses are trying to get their stories together or something like that. So I would say by far the most customary practice in a situation like this would you, is you would have the lawyer or the lawyer's investigator reach out to potential witness and try to get the information that witness has and understand it as best you can. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Clemens, uh, on December the 12th, 2007, private investigators who were working for you had a meeting with Mr. McNamee to discuss the upcoming Mitchell report. And although they did not record in the meeting, we now know that they did record it. You used portions of this recording when you filed a defamation lawsuit against Mr. McNamee, but you were selective in which portions you made public and you never released the entire recording. Now the committee has the entire recording of that meeting, and I want to ask you about it. Without knowing he was being recorded, Mr. McNamee told your investigators, one, that he injected you with the steroid Winstraw in 1998, two, that he injected you with human growth hormone in 2000, and three, that he injected you with other steroids <laughs> on multiple occasions in 2000 and 2001. Mr. McNamee confirmed to your own investigators virtually all of the facts about your alleged steroid use that were reported by Senator Mitchell. Mr. Clemens, what Mr. McNamee told your investigators in private confirms the basic facts that he told Senator Mitchell. My question is, do you think the fact that Mr. McNamee gave your investigators in private the same account as Senator Mitchell 
if that should be viewed as corroboration of his account? I'm not uh, sure exactly what all he did tell the investigators. Um, uh, I heard a, uh, what I can recollect is uh, a, a tape recording from a conversation he had with um, Jim Murray um, when I re returned home from vacation. Uh, uh, when I met at Randy Hendricks's house and with uh, Rusty Hardin's group. Yes, um, there's another part of the secret recording that you did not make public, uh, Mr. Clemens. When I read the transcript of the secret recording, I was struck by the fact that your private investigators seemed to be fishing for information about what evidence Mr. McNamee had against you. For example, your investigators asked Mr. McNamee, was there any kind of paper trail documentation on any of this stuff? They asked him also, was anybody ever there when you do this besides you and Roger? Mr. Clemens, why did your investigators uh, ask these questions? I, I, Mr. Congressman, I have um, no idea. I didn't talk to my investigators. They went out and did the investigating. I'm, I, I don't, uh, oh, okay. I I'm have sorry. one sure. final question about this transcript. One of your investigators asked Mr. McNamee this question. Hypothetically, if Roger Clemens said, that is absolutely BS, none of that ever happened. Is there any doubt in your mind that what you told us today is the absolute truth? Mr. McNamee answered, I told you more truth than I told the federal government. Question is, why did your investigators ask Mr. McNamee this question, and what do you make of Mr. McNamee's answer? Congressman, I, again, I have no idea. The investigators were doing that with the um, lawyers. Uh, and again, this man has never given me HGH or growth hormone uh, or steroids of any kind. So. Uh, so you just really don't know and you were not instructing them as they did there. That is correct. I don't, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't a part of that investigation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. I'm sorry. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling uh, this hearing. And uh, let me say, I think uh, almost everything's been asked and said that could <coughs> could have been asked at this point, so I won't uh, try to de belabor this or delay it much longer, but uh, I, I have heard some holier-than-thou types on television say that Congress has much more important things uh, to deal with, and, you know, I'll say this. We all work on all these other important issues all the time, but uh, a lot of them aren't as glamorous or high-profile as this, and so we don't have uh, some of the crowds that uh, we have, but we're working on the other major issues, too. But uh, I, uh, because of that, I was very interested when I read this comment Sunday and uh, this past Sunday in the Parade magazine. It, they had an article: Should Congress umpire baseball? And, it's, and they said in that article, it said, "Quote: Federal scrutiny, however, has led to positive changes. After the 2005 hearings, the sport tightened its drug policies and launched an extensive probe. Now Congress is pushing baseball to implement an investigative unit dedicated to steroids, independent drug testing, and better." player education. So I think some good things have come out of these hearings. I think it served as a wake-up call to many parents and young athletes around the country because w they've heard, I think, for the first time reports of people committing suicides or having uh, legs amputated or having to have psychiatric treatment because of use of steroids. So uh, I think it's been there's been some good in this. One, uh, uh, I did see a report uh, yesterday in the Washington Times in which a legal expert said that uh, uh, the case against Mr. Clemens was very, very weak, and those were his words. And I spent seven and a half years as a criminal court judge trying felony criminal cases before I came to Congress, and I would have to agree, particularly on the syringes. There's, uh, there's all sorts of chain of evidence problems. Uh, I don't think those syringes would be admissible in almost any court in this uh, uh, country. but. One, th one thing I'm not clear on, and maybe it's been covered, I've been in and out because of these votes, 
Mr. Clemens, did you refuse to uh, uh, meet with the uh, Mitchell Commission? Congressman, I was not told um, uh, uh, about to come down and, and uh, visit with uh, uh, Senator Mitchell. Um, he was, again, he was, uh, I believe he asked the Players Association is the way that the, um, the process worked. The Players Association then contact uh, agents. I don't believe any players, what, uh, from what I understand, uh, maybe Jason Jambi did go down. He had already talked to uh, the grand jury or what have you. Um, but no, sir, I was never told uh, uh, by my baseball agent or the uh, uh, Players Association that uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell requested to see me. I, that, those letters or phone calls never came to me. Uh, but once again, if I knew what the lies this man were telling about, I would have been down there to see him in a heartbeat, without a question. And I would like to say, again, I got a little emotional. I'm going to a little emotional in my testimony with the staff. But I'm a public person. I am easy to find. When the commissioner asked me to get myself together to go out there and, and, and the league asked me to put USA on my chest and represent my team, my country, I did everything I could do to get ready. They pushed my date up, tried to get me ready sooner. I told them I could shake hands and wave flags and sell tickets for you if you want to do that. But if you want me on the field, it's going to take me longer to get this body going. And I did, and I went out there, and I, I did the best I, very, I, I, I could possibly do, and I was proud to have USA on my chest. When a player went down in the All-Star game in Chicago, I happened to be on my All-Star break with my youngest son at a lake house about an hour north of my house in Houston. They found me. This player was hurt. He didn't want to pitch, collect his bonus, but did not want to pitch. They asked me if I would come pitch an inning in this game. I told them, let me talk to my family. But they found me. When all this happened, the former president of the United States found me in a deer blind in South Texas and expressed his concerns that this was unbelievable and that they stay strong and, and keep your, hold your head up high. These people found me. All due respect to Senator Mitchell, I am on the same subject to him with steroids and baseball. But Bud Selig, that league, Bud Selig, could have found me if he knew that within days what this man said was going to destroy my name, he could have found me. I'm an easy person to find. I'm an easy person to find in the public. Well, well let, me, uh, let me just say this, and I, under, I appreciate everything you just said. Uh, uh, you know, what, you've ended, what they've ended up with is a report based primarily, at least as it applies uh, to you, a report uh, based on uh, statements by a man who unfortunately has admitted here several times today that he has lied to law enforcement people and many, many others, and based on information from a man who I understand pled guilty in court and received a five-year sentence this past Friday. That, uh, it, it seems to me that there may have been uh, some people a little too anxious to uh, get this report out to, uh, and get all the publicity attendant there too. And I, you know, I hate to say those things. I. I spent five and a half years as a bat boy for the Knoxville Smokers baseball team, clubhouse boy, ball chaser, scoreboard operator. I grew up in minor league baseball, and there was a bond between bat boys and the trainers. I hate to hear what I've heard from Mr. McNamee today. I think it's a sad thing. Anyway, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Clemens, didn't you meet with your investigators before the Mitchell report was out and hear what the Mitchell report was going to say? I heard a tape uh, that was taped by Jim Murray, uh, and again, I don't know how many days it was uh, when I got back. Just, just I want to clarify. Yeah. So you did know before the Mitchell report came out that it was going to talk about you? I found out on a, I believe it, um, again, I don't know the day or week, maybe a Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent to submit as part of the record Report 9 of the Council on Scientific Affairs from the American Medical Association on Hormone Abuse by Adolescents and also Policy H470.976, the Abuse of Anabolic Steroids, which is an ethical policy of the American Medical Association. Without objection, we'll receive it for the record. Mr. McNamee, I was very uh, pleased to hear you admit that you were ashamed for your conduct in this whole affair. 
Um, I think that this report on uh, hormone abuse by adolescents includes the conclusion that survey data indicates that middle and high school students have been using anabolic steroids since the mid-1970s, and national surveys indicate that the use is increasing among high school students, particularly among females. And I find that very disturbing. I got a text message from my 16-year-old son during this hearing because he's homesick and he's watching this on ESPN, like many young people. And the example that you have given by working with highly paid visible professional athletes and encourage them to engage in illegal behavior for the purpose of enhancing their performance is shameful and something that everyone should be condemning. And I hope that you will take the rest of your life going out and educating young people about the dangers of steroid usage. Mr. Clemens, I know we've talked at length about this whole issue of whether or not uh, you have ever taken steroids or HGH, and I'm not going to talk to you about that, but I'm going to tell you very candidly, I am concerned about your testimony about your use of B12 injections and lidocaine, and I'm going to talk to you about that. You testified in your deposition that Mr. McNamee injected you with B12 in Toronto in his weight room and that he injected you without a prescription and you didn't know whether he was even authorized to give those injections. Do you remember that testimony? That is correct. Have you ever been diagnosed with anemia? I have not. Have you ever been diagnosed with senile dementia or Alzheimer's? <laughs> I have not. Have you ever been a vegetarian? I am not have a vegetarian. Have you ever been a vegan? I'm sorry? A vegan. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I didn't. Did <laughs> well, there's a very um, simple explanation why I asked you those questions. Sure. Because the medical literature has indications for B12 injections. Because most people have B12 occurring naturally in their systems and ingest it all the time from other substances. And the scientific literature is very clear that it is indicated in an injection form only for patients suffering from anemia, mm -hmm. low red blood cell counts, or elderly patients who are experiencing senile dementia and Alzheimer's. And the research indicates that some physicians maintain that monthly injections of B12 is required to maintain adequate levels in the elderly and patients with a diagnosed deficiency. You have clearly never been diagnosed with a deficiency, so the question for you is why were you mm -hmm. taking it? Oh, my mother in 1988 suggested that I take B12, and, and Congressman, um, uh, I've my uh, again on the professional level, my body's been um, uh, put through the paces. Uh, I was always assumed, and uh, it's a it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, in the, uh, in, I again, I think it's uh, fairly widely used. Um, I, I again, I take uh, B B12 in pill form, uh, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at it as, uh, you know, something to, it's, it's healthy. You also <coughs> testified that uh, Mr. McNamee uh, gave you chiropractic adjustments. Do you remember that? I do. You were aware that he's not a doctor of chiropractic? Congressman, when I had had my back adjusted in uh, different points of my career, uh, I've had some chiropractors that have given me uh, uh, what I would explain, I would uh, put it this way, when I would lay down on the table on the, with a couple of the chiropractors, I would hope that my lower back did adjust or crack, if you will. If it didn't the first time, the guy I, it was either embarrassed or something, but he jumped on me like he was trying to start a Harley Davidson. Uh, that's how hard it was. I explained this to Brian McNamee. He said, I should be doing that for you. Uh, again, another trusted guy who had a Ph.D. and... Um, I had no reasons not to trust him. I, uh, uh, just like other trainers and doctors and physicians, it's... Well, that's it's what I'm trying to get to. You also testified he gave you a lidocaine injection in your low back when you were having low back problems. Do you remember that? That's correct. Did he ever have you, did he ever administer a test dose of lidocaine before he gave you the full dosage? The amount that he gave me uh, did give me comfort. Did that's he give you, did he have you hooked up to an EKG monitor when he gave you that dosage? No, he did not. See, the, the problem I'm having, Mr. Clemens, is these are medical procedures we're talking about, regulated professional activities, and you're getting treatments from someone who has no medical licensure to even administer these injections or to perform chiropractic care. And I guess I have a question as a highly paid professional athlete, why you would trust your body 
which puts food on your table and takes care of your family to somebody who has no professional training to take care of you. Uh, again, he told me that he was a PhD, and I do trust him. I am a trusting person. Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I would not uh, doubt any of the trainers or doctors that would uh, – I, I would trust them not to harm me, just like you're talking about. I would trust them not to harm my body. Thank Gen you. For gentleman's time you. has expired. Mr. Issa? Thank you. And following up on that, uh, it seems like PhD must stand for pilot higher and deeper. Uh, <laughs> isn't it true, Mr. Clemens, that uh, Mr. McNamee was at times paid by professional baseball in addition to work he did for you? That's correct. Okay. So shame on professional baseball with their tens of millions of dollars of experts uh, for doing that. Uh, and quite honestly, for my colleague, yesterday, uh, I told the committee in front of a hearing about my mother getting B12 shots from our family physician. Uh, she was premenopausal and simply a little, a little anemic, she thought. And the, uh, uh, the scientist who was the foremost expert we could find on B12 basically told us it's not a really good test for a, a small deficiency. So the truth is, taking it, which cannot hurt you, might help you, and it's not easily tested for. But of course, that was yesterday's hearing. Now we go to today's. I'd like to thank the, uh, the chairman and ranking member for the past work they've done. In looking through the Mitchell report, I find that throughout the early 80s, under uh, uh, Kuhn, Kuhn and then Peter Uberoff, uh, we had a rampant problem with cocaine and other drugs mm -hmm. being abused, and little or no ramification for it. Years of work went by, and in 2002, they had a major contract negotiation uh, oddly enough, with the same uh, uh, Don Fear, who was the union negotiator, and they got an agreement with no teeth in it. So it was due to the uh, chairman and ranking members' work in 05 that I believe we can all say that uh, baseball ha began cleaning up with real testing and, and real enforcement. And for that, I'm really thrilled. Uh, last, I'm very thrilled that the chairman announced this would be the last hearing on baseball. <laughs> Uh, for the time being, and I think that's appropriate. I think we've, we've done our job. But I, since we have the Mitchell report in front of us, and since a portion has been drawn into question, I'd like to focus us back onto the Mitchell report. And I'll start with you, Mr. Clemens. Do you believe, other than the allegations of some areas that you say are incorrect as to you, that as far as you know, the rest of the report is <coughs> accurate, well done, and reflects the need to clean up baseball? Congressman, um, I have not read the entire Mitchell report, but along the lines that you're speaking, um, I do believe baseball is going in the right direction. I believe that the testing is, is good. It's, in, it's intrusive. Um, uh, I, I wish I could remember the, I believe it was one of the uh, uh, congressmen or women that brought something up that I, I do that was surprising to me, that there was a study about uh, the players uh, getting the Ritalin and right. again, I'm not an expert, but if it's, if it's some type of speed, uh, I think that needs to be possibly looked into, but I do believe that baseball is going in the right direction. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Sheeler, uh, you have read the report, obviously, and are a participant in it. Do you believe that other than this area that we're dealing with today, that your you stand by your report and believe that it is good work? We stand by our report uh, with respect to the entirety of it, yes. Even though... Uh, Mr. Conseco says that there are material flaws in it, and he's, he's presented information. I mean, I, I guess the question is, do you, you're saying you stand by it, including allegations by third parties that there are, there are flaws, including video of, of saying that, in a sense, that Mr. Clemens wasn't at a particular place that you say he was at. You don't see that as at least opening the door for some doubt on a small portion of this report. I stand by the report. Okay, with the uh, that, that's fine. A and, and to be honest, the part I wanted was, you think you did good work. Mr. Clemens thinks, for the most part, you did good work. Mr. McNamee, I, I realize that uh, you're both a principal and a participant. Do you think this report is good, leaving aside for a moment one area of controversy? I believe the report is good. Okay. Now, do you think that the lies you've told repeatedly have called into question the one portion that we're having this hearing on today? Uh, just just the, the credibility uh, question of you. Has that, has that hurt the ability for the people in this committee to believe this one small portion? No, it shouldn't. Okay. And so you don't believe that, uh, <coughs> that the numerous lies that you've told and admitted to, uh, that uh, 
uh, Jose Canseco's uh, saying that you're lying about uh, steroid pills being given. Uh, you don't believe that the uh, series of emails in which you uh, repeatedly asked for, even while in cooperating investigation, asked for an endless series of, uh, of freebies from people on behalf of uh, Roger Clemens. Things like Under Armour all, uh, or Under Armour, uh, where you asked for all sizes, uh, big and small, back in 06. In 05, where you, uh, uh, you know, you said you were suing, contemplating suing, but of course that wasn't a real threat. Or the LA Times in 07. You don't believe that any of those are the reason that although we all agree that this is generally a good report and it closes a sad history, you don't believe that that creates a situation today in which we'd like to close this report without your testimony and without believing you because you don't seem to be believable? You don't see that as, as even remotely possible? The gentleman's time has expired. No. But please answer the question. No, I don't. Okay. Well, shame on you. Th thank you, Mr. Issa. Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me start off by saying that two years ago when this committee held hearings on this issue, I supported that decision because we have jurisdiction over our nation's drug policy. But I think it's important that we be very careful over how we exercise that jurisdiction, and I'm convinced that this hearing today is a shift away from questions about widespread use of steroids in baseball and instead focuses on alleged wrongdoing by individuals. I certainly so hope, that, hope that in the future we'll be real careful about how it approaches situations like this one because if we called everybody in sports that's ever been accused of doing steroids before this committee, then we would shut this place down and hold nothing but hearings with athletes who have been accused of using performance-enhancing drugs. That's not our role in this process, and I certainly hope this show trial will teach us that very valuable lesson. The name of our committee is Oversight and Government Reform, and I hope that there are more important things for oversight and reform of this government than alleged bad behavior of individuals. Mr. McNamee, in your opening statement, you indicated that your decision to release the so-called evidence of bloody gauze and pads and syringes, uh, supposedly of Mr. Clemens, was because you believe Mr. Clemens betrayed your trust when he recorded a phone conversation that the two of you had, I believe on January the 6th of 07. You said just this morning that what angered you most about the recording of that conversation was that the entire country heard about your son's private medical condition. And yet, uh, 15 minutes after making that statement, uh, Ranking Member Davis asked you about that tape phone conversation. He asked you why you repeatedly said, what do you want me to do every time that Mr. Clemens told you that he wanted the truth? You told Congressman Davis that it was because you knew the conversation was being taped. If you knew the conversation was being taped, then why would you talk about the private medical condition of your son? It wasn't so much uh, that I was could be sure that Roger was taping it, but I didn't know who was listening to it, and I didn't think he would air it on national TV. Well, furthermore, if you knew it was being taped, wouldn't it have been the perfect opportunity to tell Mr. Clemens that you did tell the truth? That instead of saying repeatedly, what do you want me to do, you would have said, Roger, I've told them the truth. I mean, isn't this a conversation that you were having with Mr. Clemens about what the truth really was? The conversation was for him to call my son. Sir? I, I didn't call, I didn't need to speak to Mr. Clemens. I asked him to call my son. The conversation, he asked me to call his office. I called his office with the hopes that he would call my son. But during that conversation, uh, you did ask him what you wanted, uh, what did he want you to say, and did he not tell you that he wanted you to tell the truth? As I, I said to, um, in the original statement, that I, I did in my own way, as I speak. And if you had known me, you would have known what I meant to the answer to that question. It is what it is. The truth is the truth. So what I said was the truth. What you said was the truth, but you never told Mr. Clemens that what you said was the truth. When he asked you to tell the truth, why didn't you just say in plain English so everybody could have understood you? That if, if I had known he was going to air it on national TV, I would have said I did tell the truth. But as far as him taping a conversation, 
and releasing personal information on my son. I, I wouldn't have said that if I knew it was going to be aired on national TV, and I would have I said I did tell the truth, but it is what it is. It depends on if you, is what, what is means, I guess. Um, <laughs> Mr. McNamee, when, uh, when you first spoke to the government about this matter, did uh, they threaten to prosecute you for dealing drugs or maybe practicing medicine without a license? No, sir. They did not. When you first spoke with the government about this case, did they tell you that they already knew that Roger Clemens used steroids or uh, human growth hormones? No, sir. When you first spoke to the government about this case, did they pressure you into saying that Roger Clemens used steroids or human growth hormones? Not so ever. Mr. Clemens, um, you have said publicly that baseball should have done more to give you a chance to address these allegations, and I just heard some more of that a while ago. And Senator Mitchell sent a letter to the Players Union uh, advising that there were uh, been allegations made against you for use of performance enhancing substances between 1998 and 2001. Number one, I think you've explained why you didn't respond because they didn't try to get in touch with you. But is there something more that baseball should have done to respond to this and to inform the players that were mentioned in the book uh, that this was going to come out? Well, I, I, from my understanding that they made a, uh, the, the Mitchell people made a, a phone call back to Mr. McNamee to go down the list of everything that he said. And again, um, uh, it, it, my stance is I believe baseball is doing the right thing. I think with our testing and everything is going in the right directions. Um, um, I, again, Mr. Mitchell, uh, what it says in the report, I was not made aware that he wanted to speak to me. Uh, well, Mr. Clemens, is it fair to say that uh, Mr. Selig or, or somebody from the Players Union would have known how to get in touch with you? Without question. I alluded that, uh, Mr. Congressman, early about uh, how I felt about that. And um, once again, I, I believe uh, being one of the more visible players in the game over the, the last years, uh, that that courtesy would have been extended to me. The gentleman's time has Mr. expired. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Sheila, we've given uh, Mr. McNamee and Mr. Clemens an opportunity to uh, discuss some of the, what we saw as inconsistencies. I want to talk to you for a second. In a defamation suit that was filed by Mr. Clemens, he criticized the investigative tactics of, uh, of your investigative tactics. He alleged that the interview of Mr. McNamee was conducted like a Cold War interrogation. He says that a federal agent just read Mr. McNamee's previously obtained witness statement and had Mr. McNamee confirm each statement. The implication was that you didn't question Mr. McNamee to assess his credibility. Mr. Clemens's lawyers made this claim. They said, our understanding is in the only in-person interview of the chief accuser, Brian McNamee, it is our understanding that the prosecutors who made the deal asked the questions in front of Senator Mitchell. They indeed asked leading questions and simply asked McNamee to affirm what he had previously said. So in essence, he was on a short leash with those who had, of course, challenged and can take away his liberty. We have no reason to believe whatsoever, maybe we're wrong, that Senator Mitchell's people asked questions, that they asked questions in a setting that was really conducive for McNamee to lay out what really happened, as opposed to the prosecutors themselves asking it. What is your response to that, Mr. Sheila? That account is absolutely incorrect. We interviewed Brian McNamee three times. The first interview occurred in July 2007. It was at Senator Mitchell's law office in New York. Present were Mr. McNamee's counsel, Senator Mitchell and members of his staff, including me, as well as some federal law enforcement officials. At the very outset of the interview, Mr. McNamee was informed that he faced criminal jeopardy only if he failed to tell the truth. Senator Mitchell could not have been more clear in following up on that saying that all Senator Mitchell wanted was the truth and the complete truth. After that introduction, Senator Mitchell asked the lion's share of the questions, and the interview with Mr. McNamee proceeded much as many of the other 700 plus interviews that we conducted what were, just seeking to find the truth. I occasionally asked a question, federal law enforcement officials occasionally asked a question. But for the most part, it was Senator Mitchell do doing the questioning, and he made clear he wanted the truth, and the federal law enforcement officials made clear that Mr. McNamee faced criminal jeopardy if he failed to tell the truth. 
There was then a second interview by phone in October 2007. Again, these same warnings uh, were provided to Mr. McNamee. And again, we went over the information. Finally, there was a third interview in November 2007. At that time, I read to him the statements in the draft report which we had attributed to Mr. McNamee to make sure that they were 100 percent accurate. We told him at that time, this is what we understood he had told us before, if there was any corrections, we wanted it corrected because we wanted the information to be 100 percent accurate as best he could recall. He made a couple of minor uh, corrections immaterial to these proceedings, and then we went forth from there. So just so that we're all clear on this, at the first in-person interview, uh, Senator Mitchell was not just reading questions from a transcript of something that had transpired between the federal investigators and Mr. McNamee. He actually created his own questions and asked those. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Right. I'm, not, I'm just going to wrap up. I don't have any more questions on this. Obviously, this is a hearing to try and assess uh, the um, efficacy of that Major League Baseball report. And it was all tried, I think, certainly I have tried to come here with an open mind and provide everybody an opportunity to address what seem to be apparent inconsistencies in a lot of the testimony. Uh, we've heard questions ab about those inconsistencies. Uh, some of the troubling things are still out there. I'm mindful that Mr. Knobloch confirmed Mr. McNamee's statements, that Mr. Pettit confirmed them, that in contemporaneous conversations, apparently, that Mr. Pettit had with his wife, uh, she confirms that those conversations with Mr. Pettit occurred. Uh, some of the questions about Mrs. Clemens taking the HGH and having side effects and no follow-up on that. Uh, I just think there's a lot of open questions, Mr. McNamee's uh, credibility as well on this. We're going to have to go back to the record and, uh, and, and take a look at all the transcripts on this thing to, to make a decision. Uh, I do make note, though, Mr. Chairman, it, it made an opportunity for people not to have a hearing on this. I hope that the hearing that now has transpired has satisfied all of the witnesses here that they've had their opportunity to address any of the inconsistencies or uncertainties. I thank the Chairman for conducting the <coughs> hearing, Mr. Davis, for uh, his participation and cooperation as well, and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Um, Chairman? I have a parliamentary uh, inquiry. Yes. I have a, that, um, that uh, both Mr. Burton and Mr. Westmoreland uh, and much of the national public, uh, when they heard the uh, uh, taped uh, uh, conversation live on national TV, heard this expression, it is what it is, uh, and uh, n none of us are prototypical New Yorkers. Uh, I asked, asked a New Yorker on the floor, uh, and he said that is a, a not only Mr. McNamee expression, a New York expression, M for I told the truth. Would it be appropriate in the record to have some discussion of that phrase because it's a very pivotal phrase that has been nationally debated. And well, we'll hold the record open it. if you want to submit some uh, <laughs> documentation uh, and we'll, whatever it is, it is, we'll put in the record. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this. I, I have said to the chairman myself personally that I am very concerned with the direction this committee has gone in the last year or so because I think we've been playing gotcha games and I don't agree with that. I think there are billions of dollars being wasted every minute <coughs> by the federal government and what this committee ought to be doing is looking, doing government oversight and we're not doing that. I am not a fan of holding these hearings on issues we have no business dealing with. However, I think since we're here it's important to try to get some questions answered, but I really wish we would get back to what our job is, which is government oversight and accountability. I'd like to ask you, Mr. McNamee, a couple of questions, and then, Mr. Clemens, I'd like to ask you a couple. Mr. McNamee, are you planning on trying to make money off of this situation? No, I'm not. Are you writing a book, or do you plan to write a book? No, ma'am. You don't have any uh, deals in the work with book publishers at all? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we'll see. Um, Mr. Clemens, I'm sorry, uh, and I apologize to all three of the witnesses that we've been pulled out to go vote, and I have not been here for all of the testimony, and I apologize for that, but I thank you all for, um, for spending your time here. Um, well, let me go back. Mr. McNamee, I want to ask you one more question. In the Mitchell report, you say that Mr. Clemens used HGH in 2000. 
but that he didn't want to use it again because he didn't like it. If that's the case, why would he possibly want to have his wife injected with it, which is what you've alleged? Uh, I just, he asked me to instruct her on how to do it. She continued to use it on her own, and I, you ha you're asking the wrong person. Okay. Congresswoman, if I may, uh, my wife's, uh, has been coming into question here. Can I can I read a statement from my my from my wife, please? Certainly. If I if I may. This is from Debbie Clemens, my wife, who is here in the room with me. I'm not sure of the dates, but I read a news article about the benefits of ho growth hormone. During that same week, same week, talking about the subject openly, Brian McNamee, who was at our house in Houston training people, approached me to tell me about the article. She said. He said it was not illegal and used for youthfulness. The next mid-morning, he said he had, so he had some and would be able to give me a test shot. He gave me one shot. He later left the house on his way to the airport. During that time, Roger was not at home, and I didn't have the opportunity to tell him about it later that evening when he arrived home. In telling Roger about that that evening, I was also having circulation problems with itching. It happened the following night, just not as bad. I was very comfortable in trying it, but it was a harmless act on my part. Also, since McNamee had a PhD, he was a trusted good trainer. Roger said, let's back off this. Need, we need to know more about it. And she agreed. She really didn't need it. She has been broken up over this for a long time. And she said to me, now she feels like a pawn amongst his game. I would have never instructed Brian McNamee to give my wife these shots. Once again, I don't know enough about growth hormone. Uh, I would suggest that young kids, kids of all ages, athletics, I don't know enough about it. It doesn't help you. But I also have heard, uh, uh, again, different news articles where people for quality of life have used this product. I have learned more about growth hormone in the last month uh, than I ever have known. Uh, I'm offended again that I that I was instructed and I think he said earlier it was his instruction earlier in the day that I instructed him to give my wife growth hormone. Thank you. I have a, a photo, uh, four photographs here I'd like you to look at. We don't have the exact dates on them but this photo was taken somewhere around 95 and 96, this one 98, the one over here between 2000 and 2002, and this one here sometime between 2004 and 2006. Mr. Clemens, um, you know, I am not an expert in any of these issues, but you appear to me to be about the same size in all of those photos. These were taken before the accusations that you took uh, human growth hormones, they were taking during the time that you're accused of taking them and after them. Again, it doesn't appear to me that your size has changed much in these four photos. Perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about your regime of um, conditioning that you go through. I know that you take it very seriously and maybe you'd like to say something about um, how hard you work at keeping yourself in shape and how that would result in the um, stamina and body build that you have. General Lady, time has expired, Thank but you I do want to answer briefly. Thank you, sir. Congresswoman, yes. Um, when all these false allegations came out about me, I told them to go talk to the trainers and the people around me that, that know me the best. My body didn't change. Uh, I didn't start throwing harder. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is, I, I started locating better as a pitcher. I think this has gotten a lot of mileage of it, uh, out of it. Uh, uh, general manager in Boston, who will leave his name out of it because he's got a ton of mileage out of this, said that I was in the twi he made a, a, what I feel is a smart aleck uh, comment, a remark, that I was in the twilight of my career. And in that 1996 season when I was in the twilight of my career, I tied my own single season record of 20 strikeouts. I led the league in strikeouts that year. I was in the top 10 in innings pitched in ERA. 
And if I was in the twilight of my career, I doubt that the Toronto Blue Jays ownership would have made me the highest paid pitcher in the game of baseball the following year. That following year, 1997, I won the Triple Crown Award of baseball, which is pitch, uh, wins, ERA, and strikeouts. And that's before I met Brian McNamee. Once again, it bothers me greatly that he has taken his PhD and gone out, and from what I've learned, he's coached high school kids or uh, college people. He told me Wall Street guys. Mr. Clemens, uh, you don't know whether this is true or not. The question you were asked is, do you have a good regimen for physical exercise? Do you? I do, but you've been very successful. I'm sorry? You've been very successful as a baseball player, so you keep yourself in good shape, don't you? Without question. I take a lot of pride in it. It's I, I see that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Murphy's time now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all three of you for sustaining yourselves over this l long period of time. Um, uh, listen, it, it, it's clear that someone's not telling the truth here, and I don't think I can invent or create any new questions to try to get at that, uh, um, that answer. So I, I just want to step back for a moment and ask a couple questions of Mr. Sheeler and also Mr. Clemens about how we got here and really where we move forward from here. Mr. Sheeler, we had some discussion earlier uh, about the notice that was given to uh, Mr. Clemens and uh, people that work for him. And there certainly seems to be some degree of confusion about uh, who knew why that information didn't get to Mr. Clemens, why conversations uh, did not happen um, between uh, Mr. Clemens and the committee staff. Uh, can you just address this issue as to how notice was given and uh, why there wasn't potentially a more aggressive effort made to try to get Mr. Clemens to come in uh, and address some of these before his name was uh, included uh, along with the information in the report? Certainly. Um, from the very first day of the investigation, as a matter of fact, the pe press conference in which the investigation was announced, Senator Mitchell made it clear that he would give any person about whom allegations were made an opportunity to respond before anything was printed. As a practical matter, we were informed by Major League Baseball that all communications with current players, such as Mr. Clemens, had to go through the Players Association. Those were the union rules, and we played by the rules. So in the summer of 2007, Senator Mitchell sent a letter to the Major League Baseball Players Association in which he requested the interviews of Roger Clemens and a number of others, and in which Senator Mitchell stated that we had evidence that Mr. Clemens had used performance-enhancing substances during sometime during the period of 1998 through 2001. We received a letter back on August 8, 2007, from the Players Association, in which they stated, the following players have asked us to inform you that they respectfully decline your request for an interview at this time, Roger Clemens and several others. We did not stop there, however. In October 2007, Senator Mitchell, myself, and others had a meeting with mayors, members of the Players Association because the Players Association had stated that they weren't clear on Senator Mitchell's invitation um, that any player who came in would be provided the evidence which was, uh, which had been, or the allegations which had been stated against them, shown any checks, shown any money orders, shown any corroborating evidence, and then be given a full and complete opportunity to respond. So we had that meeting with him in October, and then we sent another letter, Senator Mitchell sent another letter to the Players Association on October 22nd, in which he stated, to be clear, I have been and remain willing to meet with any player about whom allegations of performance enhancing substance use have been made in order to provide those players with an opportunity to respond to those allegations. During the course of any such interview, I will inform the player of the evidence of his use, including permitting him to examine and answer questions about copies of any relevant checks, mailing receipts, or other documents, and give him an opportunity to respond. Five weeks later, Senator Mitchell received another letter from the Players Association indicating that the, the players had been recontacted and he, he said some have been in direct contact with you, with Senator Mitchell, which was accurate, some had. On behalf of the others, we report that they continue to respectfully decline your request. 
So I would submit that given the limitations which we had, which is to say we were required by the, the uh, collective bargaining agreement to do our communications through the Players Association, we made repeated requests to Mr. Clemens and others, and we got repeated declinations. I would also add we sent, a, Senator Mitchell sent a letter to all players, including Mr. Clemens, which was, which were provided, asking anyone who wanted to come in and provide any information about steroids that they could come in. I, I, I want to turn this over to Mr. Clemens, not on the specific mm -hmm. issue of notice, uh, not on the specific issue of notice, but this to me, and I think to a lot of baseball fans out there, seems to be another instance in which a lot of people are doubting uh, the strategy and tactics of the players union and uh, listening to the testimony that they gave before this committee several weeks ago in which they uh, made a claim, Mr. Fair made a claim essentially that the uh, sole reason for the existence of the players union was to represent the employment rights of the players, not necessarily uh, to, to, to represent the best interests of baseball. Um, I'd be interested, Mr. Clemens, just to get your sense on your opinion of how the Players Association and the union has conducted themselves in this process and, and whether you have criticisms uh, of the Players Association's willingness to sit down at the table because it's going to be their uh, ability uh, to move from these hearings to sit down at the table and solve this that's going to be the legacy uh, of these hearings and this issue going forward. I'd be interested in your opinion on that issue. Congressman, thank you. I never received uh, any of those letters. Uh, on that topic there and I again I believe the uh, that baseball uh, the Players Association the committee I think everybody's working in the right direction to clean up our sport baseball and sports in general uh, I think it is very important that uh, there's we send no message to, to the young kids about that uh, and I believe the Players Association is is well aware of that and I, I believe it's going in the right direction but Mr. Clemens, you don't think that the Players Association might have had a responsibility to make sure that you were notified that you were being offered a chance to talk to the Mitchell uh, Commission? It seems to me as potentially the highest profile mm. player that they received notice regarding, they had a little greater obligation than to just tell people that worked for you. I mean, I would, if I were you, I would be angry not just at the people that work for me, but I'd be pretty angry at the Players Association as well. I, I understand, and from my understanding was they asked Senator Mitchell and his uh, people, staff, what have you, uh, what it was concerning, and they said they would not tell them just to come down. That's what that's what I've I've gotten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shays. I have a parliamentary inquiry too, yes. if I could, uh, Mr. Sheeler. I want to get a clarification on something you said, and then ask um, if we can make sure that we have exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You said that you s that Senator Mitchell sent a notice, and these were how I wrote it down. We had evidence that Mr. Clemens had used performance-enhancing drugs or something. But the key word here is evidence. You said we had evidence that he had used it. You didn't say we had allegations that he had used it. Now, I don't know technically evidence allegations but it seems to me that the that you all had made up your minds before you ever talked to Mr. Clemens is that a technical term we had evidence Ms. wouldn't Fox, it that, that, that been really appropriate to uh, use allegations that isn't a parliamentary uh, well, inquiry but, let's, but you asked your question yes, but it's a great an question yeah well let me just just so there's no misunderstanding let me just quote what the letter said this is a July 13th uh, 2007 letter to uh, the uh, general counsel of the Players Association. We listed a number of players, and for Roger Clemens, we stated, we have received information that this player allegedly used performance-enhancing substances sometime between 1998 and 2001 while a member of the Toronto Blue Jays and New York Yankees. Now, there were a number of other players mentioned as well. We Mr. had not Chairman, made up our, our minds I'm sorry, but we have well, to follow the regular order, and each member has five minutes, and you've had your five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that this is part of the problem here. You are. I'm sorry to be rude, but I think I've been more than generous, and I don't think it's fair other members aren't getting extra time to do that. We're only going one round. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, 
Mr. Uh, Clemens, I want to come back because I got to tell you that of all the testimony and the things that I've read, and if I had to, if I walked in here and it was even Stephen between you and Mr. Uh, McNamee, I must tell you the person that I believe most is Mr. Pettit. You admit yourself that he is a good guy, he's a truthful guy. And there have been a number of things that make his testimony and his deposition and that and his affidavit uh, swing the balance over to Mr. McNamee. I got to tell you, and part of it comes from your own words. Now let me go back. Uh, this is about a conversation not regarding HGH, but steroids. Mr. Pettit told us about a conversation that took place in Mr. Pettit's home in 2003, 2004. Mr. Pettit told us that Mr. McNamee said, and I quote, he had gotten steroids for Roger, unquote. Let me read to you from the transcript of the deposition with Mr. Pettit. Question, did you have any reason to think Mr. McNamee wasn't being straight with you about that? Answer, no, I had no reason to think that. Question, were you surprised? Answer, yes, surprised me when he said that. That was the first time I'd ever heard him say anything about steroids. Mr. Clemens, you have stated that Mr. McNamee is lying about the use of steroids. If he is lying now, why would he have told Mr. Pettit in 2003 and 2004 about your use of steroids? Uh, Congressman, I, I have no idea. Uh, again, Mr. McNamee never told me about Andy Pettit using uh, HGH. I, the, the running theme that I know of is that every time something came up, uh, again, a conversation with Jim Murray, Brian McNamee said, but I'm trying to warn you, but don't tell Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, have, I have no idea. All I'm telling you is if Andy, and Andy Pettit thought that I had used HGH, our relationship was such that he would have come to me. Okay, you told us yes, that several yes, times. Yes, sir. I got you that. I got it. I understand that. Let me, let me go into this. You know, I've, I've listened to you, and I've listened to you carefully. And again, I'm trying to see where to strike the balance. If I've got two people that are hard, you know, they, they're saying opposite things, I'm looking for an independent source to help me look, try to figure out which side to believe. And I've got to tell you, one of the most interesting things, and Mr. McNamee said it, and it's been borne out in the depositions, is that when McNamee gave testimony about not block, and Pettit, those allegations were borne out to be true. And for some reason, your guy, who you admire, who you think is uh, one of the, the greatest guys, an honest guy, and everybody says he's a religious guy, when he, although he, you, when it comes to you, it's a whole nother thing. You, you follow what I'm saying? So you're saying that Mr. McNamee lied about you, but he didn't lie about the other two. How do you explain that? Again, Congressman, I am I am with certain that when Andy Pettit w when Andy Pettit used HGH, why didn't he tell me that he used HGH? I never learned about any of this. I am Andy and I are close friends. We were plain travel mates. If he misheard me on a subject that I was talking about, some gentleman's using HGH for quality of life, like I stated, then he, mis he misunderstood that. I, I I'm, think t I'm telling you, in it, uh, again, that he should have had no doubt in his mind when he came into the locker room when the Mitch report was, uh, the LA Times report was released about having us implemented in that ordeal. He sat down and looked at me. I still, at that time, did not know. My time is running out. I, I, got I, I hear you, but my time is running out. That I, again, he looked at me, wringing his hands, white as a ghost, and asked me, what are you going to tell him? And I told him, I'm going out there to tell the truth. I didn't use any of this stuff. That alone should have took Andy off any kind of wavering or whatever he's well, had. Well, again, as I said before, I've listened to you very carefully, and I, I take you at your word. And your word is that Andy Pettit is an honest man and his credibility pretty much impeccable. Your lawyer says the same thing. 
But suddenly, and, and, and the committee gave him time after time after time to clear up his testimony, and he consistently said the same thing on the oath. Not only that, his wife, he goes and tells his wife everything, and then she does an affidavit saying the same thing, but suddenly he, he, he misunderstood you. All I'm saying is it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe you, sir. I hate to say that as a, a you're one of my heroes, but it's hard to believe you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Mr. Shakes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you and uh, Mr. Ranking Member for uh, beginning these hearings in 2005. I felt uh, the initiation of these hearings were spectacular in the sense that we finally got Major League Baseball to wake up <coughs> and uh, the other sports as well. They originally uh, refused to come in in 2005 and they said, uh, we don't have, uh, you know, we have our rules and requirements, but they're not in writing. We found out they were in writing. Uh, then they said it was only a draft. We found it wasn't a draft. Uh, they said uh, that the standard was tough, and we looked at it, and it was you were either suspended or fined, and it was 10 strikes and you were out. And so uh, major uh, improvements have happened since then. I think the value of the Mitchell Report was that it said things were pervasive, but this was not a document where the players had been, for instance, tested. Is that correct? You had no test results of any players uh, that had had performance uh, enhancing drugs. Is that correct, Mr. Sheeler? It's correct that we did not have any test results prior to 2005. In 2005, test results became public, right, but prior I, to that, we did not. My point is, most of these players, it's accusations, it's slips, and so on. I'm not suggesting uh, where there's smoke, there isn't fire. Sure. But this is not a document that sends people to jail. And I, my recollection of Mr. Mitchell's report was he was saying, we got a problem, we need to clean it up, and to start to go back and uh, see about who you prosecute and so on, in his judgment, I think was, you know, you'd be going down in a wrong direction. So now we have a player here, one player. There were 89 players. One player is here. And he's here because everyone in this audience knows he is the icon in baseball. He's what brings all these cameras and all those people out there, in my judgment, were lining up like you're going to a Roman circus, seeing the gladiators fight it out. And so my view of this hearing is this isn't where it's at. It's not where it's at. I mean, for you, Mr. Clemens, it's where it's at because it's your life. For you, Mr. McNamee, I believe some of what you say, but you know, it depends when. I, I view you as a police officer who was a drug dealer. And when I read your comment, to put it in context, the issue of steroids and performance enhancing drugs in baseball was starting to pick up steam in 2000. While I liked and admired Roger Clemens, liked and admired Roger Clemens, I don't think that I ever really trusted him. Maybe my years as a New York City police officer had made me wary. What a strange comment. If the players didn't ask, that, excuse I me. I read that comment, and I think maybe a police officer would have made you not want to be a drug dealer, but instead it made you be wary of him. But I just had that sense that if this ever blew up and things got messy, and they're pretty messy, aren't they, Roger would be looking out for number one. Well, that's understandable. He's going to look out for himself. I viewed the syringes and evidence that would prevent me from being the only fall guy. So congratulations, you're not the only fall guy. Congratulations. I understand your concerns, but as far as your uh, comment about a drug dealer, I only did what players asked, and it was wrong. Mr. McNamee, you are a drug dealer. You may in the That's end- That's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. You were dealing with drugs. Okay. You were dealing with illegal drugs. Tell me as a police officer how that isn't not being a drug dealer. That's your opinion? No, it's not my opinion. I'm asking you to tell me. Tell me how it's legal to do illegal things and you not call it what you were. You were dealing in drugs, weren't you? Uh, dealing in them, yes. Were they legal drugs? No, they weren't. Thank you. Will the gentleman yield? I certainly think you would agree that the players that asked him for drugs were also dealing with an illegal I would, substance. and reclaiming my time, that's a good point. If you had 89 players here, I'd feel a lot better about this hearing. But would we just have one. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. 
Just one more question for you, Mr. McNamee. Sure. Isn't it true that if you were injecting people with drugs, illegal drugs, and that made them perform better, that helped your career as a performance enhancing uh, trainer? And wouldn't it be true that if you couldn't have done as well without drugs, in fact, what you were doing is putting drugs into people to benefit your career? And I please I don't just give me the asked. I used to be a cop answer, okay? No, I, I just did what they asked. I didn't. I just do what they asked. You know, that's what every drug pusher says is, is we wouldn't be selling them if there wasn't asking for them. You know, earlier I talked about pilot higher and deeper. I wasn't talking about PhDs who get their degrees through the front door. I was talking about people like you who obtain one through a mill for the purpose of tricking and deceiving people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McNamee, did you deceive anybody when you gave them a shot, or did they know what they were doing? Mr. They Chairman, they regular doing. order. Huh? Mr. Chairman, Ms. regular Watson? order. Mr. Chairman, he deceived me. Well, that's your, your opinion, too. Ms. Watson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I do hope that uh, all the witnesses have had a break. This has been going on a long time. Uh, I've listened to the questions, I've listened to the responses, and I really don't know where this hearing is going, but I do hope that there will be something learned with the hours that we have spent listening. And I do hope that there are messages that will come out of this for those who look on our athletes and our celebrities and so on as their heroes and heroines. And Mr. Clemens, um, since you've been the subject of the questioning for the most part, Mr. McNamee, Number one, what did you think about the Mitchell Report as a document that represented some research, whether it was in-depth or substantive or not? What did you think about what you read? Congressman, I've always agreed with the Mitchell Report. Um, I have disagreements, obviously strong disagreements, with what this man, the claims he's made in that report about me. I've lived my life, I want, I've lived my life knowing that if I ever had the opportunity to chase my dreams and make it to the major leagues, that I would be an example for kids. Not only mine, but the other children. I want them to know that there are no shortcuts, that you have to work hard. When I give these talks to young kids, and I give to, to younger kids, to high school kids, to college kids, who a man was present with me at the University of Kentucky about these college kids, about taking care of your body, your body's your temple. Understand that you're a student athlete, not an athlete student. And then I put this man out in front to also say that same message to them. I want the kids to know that, that with hard work, that you can achieve your goals, whatever it might be. Yes, you are gonna fail. You're gonna fall down, you're gonna stumble, and that's the, the message I try and preach to these kids, but you gotta pick yourself up and go. And I want the kids that are out there listening to that day to understand that, that there are no shortcuts, that steroids are bad for your body. Everything that we've heard about steroids are bad for you. They break you down. I believe it's a self-inflicted penalty um, I want the children to know that. Uh, Mr. McNamee, yes. what did you think about the Mitchell Report? I think it was a document that needed to be done, and it's not really up to me on what people's opinion of that is. All I know is I told the truth in that document. Uh, as you know, all of you were sworn in. That is what happens in this committee. And... Uh, if you don't speak the truth, and there is evidence that showed that you were not telling the truth, you can be found <laughs> guilty of <coughs> perjury. And so what would you like to say to the public? This is all on C-SPAN. There have been at least 100 uh, press people out there, if not more. So this is going out across the nation and probably abroad as well. What would you like to say not in your own defense, but about that report and about baseball. 
to young people? You're addressing the question to me? Yes. I, th I, I think the, the report is maybe the first chapter in maybe a bigger document that would have to disclose more information on how, how much this, this really was involved, the drug use in baseball was involved. And as far as young people, uh, we really need to address that <coughs> deeper in the roots of, of the younger people's coaching staffs and the parents. We need to educate parents what to look for. We need to educate high school coaches, youth ball coaches. We need to educate the college coaches. Major league players, they're adults. They're gonna make adult decisions. You have to get the root of the problem. All you did was, all, all, all the Mitchell Port would do, it did was scratch the surface of a much larger problem, but at least it started it. It's chapter one. So it's up to you guys. We're sitting here now. Let's go back down to the grassroots of where baseball started. If you wanna get into the high school and the colleges and the youth balls, let's educate the trainers, let's educate the fathers, the mothers, the babysitters, let's educate everybody about the signs of what to look for and what, what's gonna be encouraging to these people as al alternative um, methods. Let me just ask you this, my time is running out. There were some pretty harsh things said just a few minutes about you. And what would you say about your own involvement in all of this as a trainer? What, how would you describe your involvement? Well, my involvement, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm not proud of it and I wish I wasn't here, but I am. So th there's gotta be something good that comes out of this and hopefully it'll start happening after this meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ms. Watson. That uh, concludes our questioning and our testimony. I wanna uh, recognize Mr. Davis for a concluding statement. Um, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank uh, the witnesses. It's been a, a long day and I'm sure there were other things you would have preferred to have done today. Um, but let me just say that um, the underlying report by uh, Senator Mitchell, I think, remains largely intact. There is this bone of contention on this particular item that I think we've tried to give some focus to today that I think will have, um, d doesn't in any way, shape, or form, uh, I think, take away from the underlying um, recommendations that the report has made. As far as uh, this goes today, this has been, I think, a robust discussion, uh, a lot of questions at issue, um, and uh, I guess history will, will judge that. Mr. Waxman and I will talk about how we handle it from here, but I, I want to thank both witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, I think some, uh, you know, I have my own opinions on it, but I think so, so did probably the viewing audience. Our goal when we started this was to send out the message that steroid use was dangerous, it was wrong, it was illegal, and you had a million kids taking it. Major League Baseball's changed their policies, and we're hoping they'll change them again in light of the Mitchell recommendations. And it's good to hear the one thing you agree on is that you agree with that underlying recommendation. So I want to thank you both for coming here today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. We've worked together on this whole issue from the very beginning of 2005 when you were chairman, now that I'm chairman. And this is not anything that separates us as Democrats or Republicans. We all care about this issue. Uh, each member and perhaps everyone in the audience that watches this hearing will reach uh, his or her own conclusion. But this is what I think we've learned. Chuck Knobloch and Andy Pettit confirmed what Brian McNamee told Senator Mitchell. We learned of conversations that Andy Pettit believed he had with Roger Clemens about HGH. And even though Mr. Clemens says his relationship with Mr. Pettit was so close that uh, they would know and share information with each other, Evidently, Mr. Pettit didn't believe what Mr. Clemens said in that 2005 conversation. Doesn't mean he was mis not the, mistaken, sir. Doesn't mean that, uh, it but does he not mis It does not mean that he was not mistaken, Excuse sir. Excuse me, but this is not your time to argue with me. Evidently, he didn't believe it in your second conversation because he went ahead and issued a uh, statement to us, as did his wife. Mr. McNamee, you've taken a lot of hits today. In my view, some were fair and some were really unwarranted. There will be some members who will focus on your inconsistencies, but as Mr. Souter pointed out, that may not be unusual in these types of situations. I want you to know, though, as chair of this committee, I appreciate all your cooperation with our investigation, and I want to apologize to you for some of these comments that were made. The rules do not allow us to comment on each other when we have time 
that's yielded, and a member can say whatever he or she wants in that five or ten minute period of time. I, I think um, uh, people who look at this whole question will not just look at the conflict of testimony between the two of you, but others who express views on this matter as well. But let me end by saying that we started this investigation in baseball to try to break that link of professional sports and the use of these drugs. And we don't want to look at the past any longer in baseball, and we didn't even want this hearing today, as I indicated in my opening. We want, in the future, to look at making sure that we don't have steroids, and human growth hormone, and other dangerous drugs used by professional sports who are role models to our kids because we're seeing the culture of the clubhouse become the culture of the high school gym. Uh, that concludes our hearing today, and we stand adjourned. Thank you. I want to go talk to